I want to acknowledge that this is has been a, a fairly uh, involved study, and I really think our study team has done a great job. So um, Anne and Steve and I are on the call today. We also have some folks that we're hoping can come into the final stages of this, um, members of our league, and I'll put out a, a call for that um, at the end of this project uh, update. We elected to use a Zoom format for this so that we could be sure to have a good recording for our YouTube channel. Uh, the International Port of Coos Bay, this is the study update. It's almost exactly a year from the first presentation, which was January 22nd of last year. So the, the port um, has been the subject, as, as, as Alice explained, that we've had uh, study updates and this is an update that has been going on since 2021. And uh, she gave us the background that these are, they're, they're slow moving. As, as Alice says, we're not real nimble with what we do, but we try to be thorough and, and really make sure that we, we cover as, as much as comprehensively as possible. So uh, just a, a refresher for those of you that watch the YouTube that from last year or were more familiar with port, <clears throat> ports in business in, in Oregon, uh, we've got 30, or 23 ports in the state and um, a number of them on the Columbia River and the estuary there and then uh, along the coast. The, um, the deep water ports on the coast are really the Astoria, Newport, and here in Coos Bay. The others um, are the St. Helens and Portland are, are deep water ports that are considered to be in the Columbia. Uh, there's various chapters in our um, Oregon rules. And, and there's a lot of detail in that, and I'll address some of it today, but um, we will be putting more of it in our white paper for sure. Um, if you look at the, the ORS 777, um, which is was sort of the oldest uh, portion of this legislative mandate, uh, began actually, if you look at the dates of different components of it, was started in the 60s, and a lot of it was uh, uh, put in in the 70s. And so we're looking at legislative operations that um, perhaps need to be updated with, with new information and, and reviews of, of how things work. The role is pretty clear that the ports have a, have a big role in economic development and that uh, the state recognized that the economic development needs to be supported by the whole of Oregon uh, to expand uh, potential commodities and diversify the economy. So that's, then, that's kind of the philosophical basis of where they're coming from uh, in this legislative mandate. So the objectives today are going to be looking at some highlights of our study, bringing it up to date in the last year, um, and then examining our previous policy goals and vision for the port. And, and again, uh, looking at these historical mandates and looking at conflicting or potential new interpretations of those and um, ending with what we see as a, as a highlighting an opportunity for a new vision for our community and how we um, look at the port and its assets. So uh, Alice explained that the way we do this is reviewing our, um, a lot of data. We, look, we followed meetings. Uh, we followed the recent change in commission leadership. We've studied the plans for the large cargo terminal that, um, and rail expansion and other land acquisitions. Um, and we certainly have researched, uh, continue to research plans for deepening and widening of the federal navigation channel and looked at um, how other ports are, are working with 
with change regarding uh, environment and <coughs> climate issues. Uh, the, the 2015 strategic business plan still remains to be their uh, planning horizon at this point. And when I look at this as an opportunity for engaging in a new planning horizon as we move uh, into the end of that particular time period. Um, but they, they, um, they state, this is an actual requirement to meet the obligations of, of the business org and requirements for, for some of the funding that they receive. So it, it's supposed to be a flexible document to, to, to guide the port commission for priorities and policies. Uh, if you look at this capital improvement plan, uh, um, the 2015 strategic plan, it has five elements that are highlighted uh, under the mission of promoting sustainable development to enhance the economy of the Southwest Oregon. And we're gonna go through these um, kind of piece by piece. Uh, two of these refer to the, to the railroad operations and infrastructure and then one component uh, regarding the Charleston fishing community, and then uh, two, the bulk commodities and channel deepening. So I'm going to turn this over to Steve, who's um, really our expert on, on railroad operations. And so I'll let him be our speaker now and uh, take it away, Steve. Uh, the port is looking at many projects and funding sources for, for projects that are focused on the rail line upgrades and maintenance. And uh, the Coos Bay Rail Line Bridge, Tunnel, and Track Rehab improvements are top among them. And um, access improvements to it as well. As you can see on the map, the, the rail line route from Coos Bay to Eugene is really quite curvy. And you probably know that a lot of it is mountainous and it involves uh, rugged terrain and um, lots of uh, possibilities for landslides, down trees, and some of which I saw recently in our family trip back from Eugene. There were a couple of places where trees had fallen across the line and one of them was being serviced by a uh, rail line maintenance crew right at the abutment entering the uh, Cushman Bridge. A, a tree had slid down slope and onto the track there and they were preparing to cut it and remove it. The uh, projects at the bottom I think are uh, show some upcoming uh, issues that they're going to be addressing with at, at different locations and I'm not exactly sure of uh, the locations of all those though. Um, some of these photos here uh, represent some of the challenges that the rail line faces um, and there are quite a few of them. There are more, more than 240 crossings of the rail line, 14 of those are signalized throughout the uh, rugged terrain to Eugene. Um, those crossings service private drives to homes and properties. Uh, there are some that cross to a group of homes that are across the tracks. Others go to businesses and farmlands and such. So they have a, a, a big issue and, and removing uh, train crossings uh, is a big issue for rail lines all over the country. Any opportunity they can have to remove rail line crossings, they try, try to take it. Um, the tunnels on the rail line, as you can see in the lower right picture, that uh, shows one of the rougher looking tunnels on the rail line. Um, you can see that tr uh, trees have fallen there. And uh, this, uh, these tunnels were designed and built uh, over 107 years ago to service the small scale uh, train service carrying uh, wood products mainly out of, out of the area. And uh, those, those tunnels are, are tight on the sides. And also, if they were to serve as a container terminal, they would need to be crowned out. That is cut probably nine inches to more than a foot or more at the top and sides so that uh, the double stack 
that uh, rail cars carrying containers could pass through those tunnels. And there are nine of them on the rail line. One of them was nearly a mile long. Uh, on the left hand image, you can see a tree down across the rail line. And I think that's a pretty frequent uh, issue that needs to be addressed promptly. Um, the weather is rugged and that uh, exacerbates some of these issues with falling trees and, and some sliding of the land uh, joining the tracks and onto the tracks. The, uh, another challenge in the uh, rail line operation is, is the uh, old swing span bridges, as well as the other bridges in the, of the 121 count bridges on the rail line. Um, the swing span bridges have um, posed some, some uh, maintenance and rebuilding problems and considerable costs. And uh, there have been a number of emergency repairs also that have popped up in recent years. One of them back, uh, oh gosh, it was around October of this fall that uh, uh, one of the hangers between a couple of spans was detached and hanging. Uh, it was observed and reported to the port and uh, they immediately responded with a um, contract, an emergency contract for 651,000 plus dollars for addressing that. And that was, there was a later addition to that, which was approved in December. But uh, that was a structural safety issue. And to allow, to allow the continued operation of that uh, bridge, they had to address that really quickly. Um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, areas in the pictures, you can see corrosion occurring and, uh, Metal fatigue is not a real issue so much on the uh, steel bridges, which there are a number. And uh, the main issue is corrosion. And uh, as you can see, um, because of our location, that's a big, that could be a really big issue around salt water and with the weather. And also painting hasn't been um, done in, in quite some time on, on many of those. And uh, painting is very costly on bridges. Okay. Um, the Charleston dock improvements are being uh, called on or requested by uh, citizens and members of the fishing community and uh, the Charleston Advisory Committee, which advises the port on actions that should be taken in the uh, Charleston uh, complex, which the port is responsible for maintaining and operating. At the top of the of the pane here, you can see uh, the shipyard and to the left part of that uh, area along the uh, frontage, you can see some storage that's uh, going on. And there are a lot of boats stored in there and a considerable number of them from my visit out there appear to be derelict and have been there a long, long time. And I understand the port is trying to uh, seek removal of those so they could do other things with with the property and remove that uh, continuing problem. Uh, but there are issues that are legal and uh, involve ownership of those boats. So it, it has not moved very fast. Uh, as you may know, the uh, Charleston ice plant burned up several years ago. And uh, of course, contracts were let for that replacement. And that was, that was finally done and has, it's now operating. And the lower left picture shows the uh, ice plant. Um, fishermen have called on the uh, port to build some docking in front of and around the uh, ice plant so that boats utilizing that uh, ice facility may not uh, damage or uh, threaten the pilings and the supports for the ice plant. Now they're unprotected in spots and uh, and uh, they hope to see a uh, dock put in that will offer some protection there. The uh, improvements are also being sought for the lift system at the boat yard. And um, you can see a lift here. And I think the uh, issues they're hoping to see addressed are uh, some, some that involve the uh, letting of the waves down into the water and also removing the boat and the 
uh, equipment from the water to work on boats. Uh, the uh, fishing community has concerns about the offshore wind um, potential, and they've voiced the, those continually at port commission meetings from 2022 to 23. It's ongoing as well. The uh, potential impacts they're concerned about are both environmental and the ocean areas that would be affected as some of the preliminary siting for these wind farm uh, elements are located on some of the very best fishing fishing grounds for our fishing fleets. And um, so those are a big major concern. And in fact, the Oregon Trawl Commission, the Crab Commission and others are asking the port to support a resolution that they've drawn up to the Bureau of Ocean uh, Energy Management, BOEM, to slow down the current fast track leasing process that's underway to provide a really uh, robust and upfront analysis on the envir environmental and economic impacts to create a transparent process that includes all the stakeholders and not to rush into massive leasing immediately here. Uh, the lower uh, image shows a, one of the wind turbines uh, in operation. There are a couple of capital improve or development proposals uh, that have some connection in the uh, uh, that the port is undertaking, and one one involves bulk commodities and and uh, the channel deepening that's being proposed. The uh, on, with the commodities, uh, there has been a recent purchase of the former Georgia Pacific property which the port is calling Terminal One. It was finalized in purchase on January of 2022. And the total project cost came to 14 million and a half with a bond issuance fee of $83,000 and the total overall cost of 14 million six. And um, they have also received 4 million of ARPA Funds. Those are federal funds associated with COVID by uh, uh, Anderson and Wright, our area uh, state legislators, and also an additional four and a half million for construction, which are federal funds. The contractor business is also being sought for the property, and as yet, uh, the port has said nothing about uh, having found a partner to to use some of the site. Um, the aim of the uh, Terminal One property is to develop appropriate industrial and marine industrial uh, sites around Coos Bay to diversify marine and rail commodity movements. There is also uh, a proposed uh, intermodal container ship development for the North Spit. This has been ongoing since 2021 and 2022, continuing today. Uh, the proposal is to build a full scale container terminal, potentially bringing to the port up to 2.4 million 20 foot equivalent boxes every year. And uh, the estimated cost that has been listed in a proposal to the US Department of Transportation is $1.2 billion. The, the uh, port is in operation under an agreement with the North Point Development, which is a Missouri land developer and uh, logistics company to develop infrastructures that's needed to service the multimodal containers project that they're proposing. The funding uh, is being applied for from the US Department of Transportation for one of their mega grants, which are being offered as part of the infrastructure um, campaign uh, currently. Um, it's expected that uh, there may be some movement on the mega grant announcements here upcoming fairly soon, but uh, just when it's not exactly known. So how does 2.4 million TEUs compare with other container ports um, in North America? The um, major container ports listed in millions of 
TEUs, those are 20 foot equivalent units, which are the international standard, standard for discussing uh, container capacity. You have the Seattle Tacoma uh, combined ports at 3.8 million TEUs, Vancouver, BC at 3.4, Prince Rupert one, that's also in BC. Uh, the Long Beach and LA ports are uh, performing at a rate of for Long Beach 7.5 million and LA 9.5 uh, for 17 in total together. However, um, uh, Long Beach and LA overperformed during the uh, scramble for uh, during COVID uh, and produced 20 million TEUs output in 2021. Um, Oakland also has 2.4 million TEUs in output. There's some photos here, and um, the one on the left is the LA Long Beach um, complex. LA and Long Beach ports own over 40 miles of uh, ocean and bay frontage, and uh, a considerable portion of this photograph is involved in the massive LA Long Beach container terminals operations. And I uh, had an opportunity to be there when we went to visit our daughter uh, this last year. And it, it's just awesome, the scale and the busyness and the involvement of that surrounding region in these ports activities. And the photo on the top right does show um, one of the uh, lot one of the California ports in LA or Long Beach, and it shows uh, container operations. You can see one in particular, and including the rail line component and to the far right in the back. And also in the distance, you can see more cranes. It wraps around the bay and there are more terminals there. I think they're, I don't know, there are almost 20, around 20 terminals in the LA Long Beach complex. And on the lower right is one of the big carriers. This one is probably could carry 15 to 18, maybe 20,000 uh, TEUs or 20 foot equivalent units on this, on this uh, ship. They're in really massive, about the size or bigger than a, a US aircraft carrier. Um, emerging from COVID has change the demand and port congestion at U.S. ports and probably ports all over the world. Um, there's, there have been some of these changes involving uh, demand and port congestion have had off, off takes or off spins from that. And that is with a declining demand, you have uh, less activity and there's been competitive lowering of pricing as the demand and congestion declined. And uh, so that has resulted in less profit for, for the shippers and for the ports themselves. Uh, American ports have now added and continue to add a lot of new capacity to address the unprecedented surge in demand seen during the pandemic and also address anticipated future needs. Many container shippers changed vessel destinations during that surge to the Gulf of Mexico and even the East Coast ports. And they were avoiding the West Coast backlogs and delays, but in doing so, they created congestion there as well, which has been alleviated as long, as well as the uh, port congestion in the West. The shipping industry media are now reporting that overcapacity exists at, uh, an uh, important uh, danger. And they're even scrapping less efficient vessels and increasing the size of vessels to, to seek a more efficient, uh, cost-effective transportation of containers to ports. And still, with this overcapacity looming, some ports continue to increase their container handling capacity, including those big ports of LA and Long Beach. In fact, uh, this uh, just just before the turn of the year, 
the state of California has given the ports of LA and Long Beach $840 million to upgrade their capacity to handle containers at the port. Um, it's been observed that uh, the biggest problem in, in uh, constraining service or productivity of ports usually doesn't involve the cranes offloading the containers from the ships, but it involves the logistics of handling them on the dock uh, and storing them, getting them on trains and getting the trains out of the ports to the class one rail lines around the United States. That's the biggest slow up in, in the uh, industry, it seems. Um, so, a lot of money is still going into, the, into upgrades and upgrading capacity to service container uh, transportation today and in the future. That uh, Some of that money, too, that's going to LA and Long Beach is, is going to go toward an 80-foot dredging project for the uh, approach to the uh, terminals there. Um, they will need that 80-foot deep dredging to service these big uh, 18 to 24,000 uh, TEU units, like the photograph in the above picture, uh, above pane. And um, that, uh, that is one of the chief uh, challenges for ports. And it's driven by the shippers because they are ordering the biggest ships and they're doing so for economic reasons and profit. But uh, the ports have to respond to this. And that, that's showing up in the LA Long Beach ports and all other ports in the United States. And I'm sure that it would probably show up in, um, in a container port here as well. Um, everyone is being pushed to get bigger and bigger. It's requiring more infrastructure, more dredging, uh, a bigger overall project has to be embraced when uh, a container port is sighted. The proposed location is shown in the photo on the right, and that uh, little cove that's circled in an oval is directly across from the hollowing place, which is the narrowest place on, on Coos Bay. And uh, that's where the terminal is being, could be proposed to be placed. And um, some ports, when they have limited land, they will even build out into into the channel so that they will have enough space for um, loading or, or berthing ships in front of the uh, terminal. But then in the back, they will need to have a, a rail yard for a quick trans transmittal of those containers out of the uh, uh, area of the terminal. And, and so that's a potential too that would, could involve um, siting uh, a terminal here on Coos Bay there would probably also need to be expansions in the rail lines, uh, rail line moving out of the terminal to connect with the uh, north-south Coos Bay rail line line at uh, where the causeway comes across from 101 to the North Spit. Um, and it's kind of narrow there for adding any additional lines if, if that was necessary. Uh, there, are, there are wetlands to the right and it sh uh, sharply drops to those wetlands from the railroad tracks and finding space could be a question, but uh, those are some of the issues that uh, are going to need to be addressed. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to come back in to discuss uh, the channel modification that um, is part and parcel of this kind of combined uh, proposal of a container port. Just to update you that our League of Women Voters uh, throughout the Jordan Cove project um, discussions and proposals to the agencies for approval uh, the league joined with three other leagues um, in Oregon to strongly oppose the Jordan Cove Energy Project. And some of our uh, strongest opposition was related to land use changes that would be needed for this and uh, estuary impacts. So uh, we're just 
the slide sort of summarizes the multiple submittals that we put in to um, the Oregon agencies and also to the Army Corps of Engineers regarding permitting and so forth. Because we have strong positions already that support our, our enhancement of coastal resources and the importance of access and sustainable uses of, of watersheds and critical uh, habitat. So it is a similar issue with regard to the uh, League of Women Voters for alterations of the federal navigation channel. The current proposal that's, the, that's part and parcel of the mega grant and also has been provided money from the Oregon legislature to, to look at how they would alter the federal navigation channel from its existing 300 foot wide, 37 foot deep max situation to a 45 uh, foot deep, 450 foot wide uh, entity. Now the federal navigation channel uh, is all co consultations involved with the US Army Corps of Engineers. That is their responsibility <clears throat> with these and it's their um, permitting that has to be uh, achieved. And they are required for an environmental impact assessment and also um, an assessment of needs. The, the schematic figure you see here is, it's a little hard to, to read. It's uh, from the, the port's documents on their web, but if the, the smaller lines that are um, outlining this are the existing nav channel and then the proposed increased channel is sort of the pink. So from, from the project that was approved and for hiring, uh, putting out $4.5 million for consulting engineers to evaluate this, um, looking at all of the structures that would have to be developed and how much <clears throat> movement of, of um, the estuary to accommodate this, the what the, what the documents that we have um, are, are detailed here, and and they're saying that that would be a, an an area uh, that would be within 8.2 miles of the navigation channel, which would bring it up to here, and include a term a term turning basin again that was initially part of some of the Jordan Cove as well. And, um, and that would require a, a realignment of all of the navigation uh, ent entities out there that um, the ships use for, for knowing where they are in the, in the federal nav channel. So it's, it's, it's extensive, and this is only $4.5 million for the study portion of this. Certainly the construction would be far greater than that. So we have uh, put here the proposal evaluation criteria that the U.S. Department of Transportation put on their website about how they're evaluating these projects. And, and we have um, some important information gathered to all of these things. But I, I just want to highlight here that we, we're looking at, you know, the the material that, that Steve has provided in terms of the vessels and, and the issues with the railroad that we are really questioning the cost benefit of, of this kind of a project. Uh, and certainly the environmental side, uh, the safety and the economic benefits in any kind of long-term um, are, are really difficult to understand uh, regarding this. So looking at when I, we started this, that the ports are provided an amazing 
opportunity to get money from the state and from federal funds. And this is just a snapshot of the adopted budget for, for the fiscal year 22-23, which is the same as a federal fiscal year. And, and so this just gives you sort of how they're uh, allocating uh, some of the funds that are part of their budget, you can see in terms of operations. And then the biggest amount is, is in these capital projects that, have, that are considered special project funds. And we just summarized, this is just from their last report, their last budget report that summarizes the the uh, allocations to date, uh, br bridge rehab, 20.6 million, tie and surfacing, again, uh, 10 million. The channel mod that I just was talking about was part of a $15 million grant that was provided from the state of Oregon through their marine navigation improvement funds. And then the terminal one that Steve talked about. So, how do we move forward from our uh, update and analysis of the port? Um, I'm putting up here the goals that we had in the 20 aught study. And there are 11 goals there. <clears throat> and we have taken each one of these and, and we're developing a, a more of a detailed white paper analysis of whether or not these goals should be reformulated or removed. And so I'm just going to, the next slide kind of highlights the areas that we consider are of high concern to revisions. Um, the, the, sec, the number two, accurately assessing and planning for future needs. Looking at the future challenges that we have um, in terms of climate change, in sea level rise, in, in looking at international commodities and so forth, we think there's a real need to uh, more accurately assess the future needs of the port. Um, number four, uh, the public interest ahead uh, of special interests. If you look at the, the exceptional amount of money that that seems to be moving through the port a lot of it is is for services for example consulting services for consultants that that are not here they're in large cities elsewhere and where are the interests of of the fishing community in in some of this they have um they have their interests and the port is, a, is, is responding to some of their interests. But in terms of looking at overall public interest, we feel like the port is not talking to a lot of people in town. It's, um, we need to enlarge the sphere of public interest. Um, <clears throat> issue number seven, uh, again, relates to public interest. So originally, we put forth that there needs to be developed a, an adequate process through which public opinion can be heard and reviewed. And we have made statements at port meetings, and we occasionally can get that, those questions answered but it's interesting to see uh, that there's an advisory group for the Charleston, but there's not a public advisory group um, for the port in, at large. And, and we, we think it's a missed opportunity because there's a, an amazing amount of technical knowledge, uh, planning expertise right here within the communities and uh, essentially using outside consultants in some of this planning uh, may be a real loss to developing those strengths in the communities. And then issue number nine, uh, we certainly uh, 
indicate throughout um, all of this presentation that the environmental challenges of some of these proposed projects are enormous. And so we're, we're trying to accurately assess these policy goals from 2000 and update them in dialogue with our members and with the community to um, come up with some revised policy goals. Looking at the area where, where it's, it's, it is acknowledged by the port in terms of their principles, we're highlighting two here that are very germane to these issues. And one is expanding the commercial fishing and recreational touring tourism facilities. You, um, in order to have a robust fishing community of fishing opportunities, you've got to have fish production and you have to have sustainable fisheries. So we need to be looking at the big picture of what's going to create uh, the opportunity for expanded fishing and recreational tourism. And then the final highlighted area of their port principles is, is promoting responsible environmental stewardship integrated in every part of their planning and business making. And we think there's a real opportunity to really address this and bring in the community and the important uh, components of understanding how that's done. In, in this whole process, in reading the, the statutes that provide the opportunity for ports and port mandates and commissions, we think there is a real need for revisiting not only the statutes within the state of Oregon, but, but just interpreting the words of those in a, in a new vision for the port to include restoration and resilience. We, we think that there's a need to add uh, and support the development of biological infrastructure that'll improve the functioning of our estuaries, the eelgrass beds, the oysters, that can mitigate climate change, address the needs of carbon sequestration, which we call blue carbon, and to highlight how that works in terms of keeping the estuary function and connecting that to the fishing community and the functions of the estuary. Um, and just some, some of the photographs here are, are from projects that are underway in Oregon for eelgrass restoration and, and the native oyster uh, beds, which not only sequester an amazing amount of carbon, uh, but they also have habitat features that are, are helping with the resilience of, of changes in the amount of, of, of wave structures and, and challenges in the whole system to give substrate that, that is producing biomass and helping improve the functionality of, of, of the living estuary. An estuary is a living entity. We think also there's an opportunity because we've had a change in the leadership. Um, I've highlight here on the left um, are the commissioners that were here at the start of 2022. We've had resignations and changes that have occurred. And uh, the first time in, in sort of my assessment of this, uh, appointment of Nick Edwards, who's a fisher and has been on the Charleston Advisory Committee in the past and is active in, in the fishing community. And, and we have um, Kyle Olksneed Hill um, is asking a lot of pertinent questions at council meetings. 
Um, and so we think there's a real opportunity to, to move uh, an understanding of what, what we could look like in the future. So to, to round this out and open it for any kind of discussions, here's what we've got proposes our next steps that we are summarizing our findings into a draft white paper. And then as Alice said, we're planning a meeting on Earth Day. This would be not a virtual meeting. This would be an in-person meeting. And we're going to be inviting selected port commissioners to join our dialogue and assessment. And once we finish that, we hope to have a revised policy statement that we can have adopted by the league and be able to share this with uh, the state league of women voters as well um, these are not easy steps and um, we really uh, would invite more participation in some of these steps to help us get through um, if you've got an interest in joining our final white paper review or um, please contact us and uh, really appreciate your joining this and uh, I will open this up and, and give it back to Alice uh, for any kind of discussions. <laughs>